y'all what's going on welcome to the monday night live the monday night live stream let me check in with y'all here put a one in the chat if you can hear me clearly you know what i'm saying just to make sure that y'all hear me nice and clear ones in the chat where's everybody tuning in from how y'all feeling tonight let me give it some time here let me give it Sometime. Yvonne, what's going on? How you doing? Good evening. Good to see you in here. Yeah, we got an interesting one for tonight, folks. We got an interesting one for tonight. We're going to be doing a bit of a systemic analysis. 
uh, talking a little bit about education in nutrition and dietetics, talking about uh, systemic failures in our healthcare system, why doctors are very seldomly able to provide uh, solutions, meaningful solutions to uh, the chronic illnesses that we typically face. Right? Um, and it's yielding some pretty monstrous uh, health outcomes. So we're going to get into that. We're going to talk about it tonight, folks. We are going to get into it. All right. Yeah, definitely let me know in the chat how you're feeling. Um, and of course, if y'all got questions and whatnot, uh, I'm going to jump on my soapbox, talk a little bit about what I wanted to talk about tonight. I'm going to answer some questions. And by the way, if you, you see this thing here, this is a cool device right here. So this is a little mini blender. All right. So... <clears throat> In here, what I got in, in here is uh, beta alanine, citrulline malate, and creatine monohydrate. I'm pouring this in my cup here. So I got a solid eight ounces in the cup. So just put that in that little blender to blend things up right quick. And then put it in the cup. So that's how we do in here. So you, your boy is putting on a little, a little muscle mass, putting on, getting a little girthy, you know what I'm saying? A little modest girthiness going on. You know what I'm saying? Uh, after we talk a little bit about healthcare and doctors and some of the flaws there, I'm going to talk about diet and things that we can eat to improve um, mental health and motivation. All right. Um, Agnes, what's going on? Good to see you in here. So this is very important, too, to talk about um, mental health, motivation, and achieving your physiological goals are intrinsically linked. And you need all three in place, right? Um, you need adequate mental health as well as motivation in order to achieve uh, physiological well-being, right? So kind of starting at the top with those things, and they trickle down into being able to achieve your goals. So we definitely got to talk about that tonight. So I'm going to talk about that. But first, we got to start off with healthcare, right? Because people often come to me and they're a bit frustrated, right? They've been from doctor to doctor to doctor, um, seeking solutions for all kinds of illnesses and not really having any success with these things, right? So the question is why, right? Um, is it just that doctors really don't want to help you or they like, you know, kind of malicious or they don't like you or they don't care about their job or is it something else? Um, because it, it has come to my attention that it is a common belief that uh, doctors don't want to help you, right? Because they don't, they don't have an interest in, you know, providing permanent solutions to things that ail you and whatnot. And that may not actually be the case. It may be the case for some, right? I would imagine a small number, but it isn't really the case at large. <clears throat> it's a much greater issue. Plant-based wife, what's going on? Good to see you in here. <clears throat> yes, ma'am. Yes, yes, y'all. So first, in order to understand why that's the case, you got to go back. Let's go back. Let's give a hypothetical. You want to help people through nutrition. So you decide, I'm going to go to college. I'm going to go to university, and I'm going to get my degree in nutrition and dietetics. I'm gonna get my bachelor's degree, I'm gonna get my master's degree, I'm gonna become a board-certified nutritionist. 
right? Now, if you agree to go to university or college, you are consenting to conforming to the institutions that are educating you. You can't just go and just do things your own way, right? You're going through the institution, you have to do it the way that the institutions tell you to do it. So what happens is the institutions and those who lead the institutions, well, there's a lot of money behind them, right? If you give a systemic analysis of how power works, and particularly in our society, power is largely uh, run through those with the most money. The ones with the most money have the most power, have the most influence. The ones with the most money are going to be um, those who are the owners or C-suites of your largest, most profitable corporations, right? The ones who control the banks, the big corporate interests, and then they buy off politicians, they buy off those, or plant um, people who work for them inside other institutions, right? So let's say you have the hospitals, right, and the owners of the hospitals, and they're friends with those who own the health insurance companies and run the health insurance companies. And they're friends with the ones who own and run pharma companies, right? The, the, the most profitable pharmaceutical companies, right? And the pharmaceutical industry. They all know each other, right? Big money, they know each other. The biggest players at the table, right? The billionaires, they all know each other. They're friends with each other. They go out to eat with each other. They have meetings with each other. They fly all around the world to meet with each other, right? That type of thing. They're friends. They make money together. Now... If you want to work for them, you got to do things their way. And if you're coming out of college, well, who's going to be setting the curriculum for what you learn in college? It's top down. So they're going to have a big hand in what you learn, and they're going to want to dictate how you do things in large part. You get a little wiggle room here and there, but for the most part, they want to make sure that you don't stray off the reservation, so to speak, as they like to put it. <clears throat> so they're going to be dictating what's acceptable, what you can do, what you can't, right? In order to get registered, first of all, in order to get your degrees, you got to take tests. You got to repeat back to them what they taught you. So that you can get the green light. And for you to get registered, you got to jump through some hoops and whatnot. You get registered. And then in order for you to practice, you got to meet certain guidelines. Those guidelines are then set in combination with your corporate owners and your political class. And they work together and they form policy. And that policy dictates what kind of regulations you have to go to. And guess who those regulations suit? Right? The ones who own the big capital interests. Right. If you want to practice certain types of medicine, you have to practice it in a way where the health insurance companies will feel comfortable insuring it. Right. Health insurance companies pick and choose. Uh, we'll give you uh, we'll give you X amount of coverage for this. We're not covering that. Right. And this is pretty much how it rolls. So you're subordinate. So you decide you're going to work as a nutritionist, a dietitian. You're subordinate to the guidelines that the big corporate interests set. And you cannot work against them. You have to work with them under their rules. Now, why is this important? There's a such thing called a zero-sum game, meaning in order for you to win, someone else has to lose. Right, that's zero-sum. And if you lose, that necessarily means someone else is winning. Zero sum, right? So let's take preventative medicine and chronic illness reversal. That's on one hand. On the other side, there is illness treatment. And there is profit, right? And treatment is very profitable. Okay, so you got a chronic illness... You want to treat the chronic illness, and you want to treat the chronic illness as long as possible. 
If you treat that chronic illness for as long as possible, well, guess what? The longer the treatment goes on, the more money you make from treating it, right? So you treat some type of chronic illness with a medication. The person takes the medication, they consume it, and they go for refill after refill after refill, right? And over time, as they get older, right, we just tack on more medication. So maybe you start with one or two, then you end up with three or four, then five or six, then seven, et cetera. You have a whole bunch of bottles in your medicine cabinet by the time you're 60, 70, 80, 90 years old, right? And if they can get you for a surgery, well, then let's throw a surgery in there. That's a lot of money, too, and that'll do well for the hospital, et cetera, and bring in big money, right? Preventative medicine reduces the likelihood of chronic illness. So now this reduces the potential profit to treat illness, which means, well, less revenue, less profit. If you are practicing in a way that produces chronic illness reversal, well, now you're cutting the treatment short. Because now you can't treat an illness if you've reversed it. It's gone. You don't have it no more. They're out. So now there's going to be an absence in potential profit there. So... Preventative medicine and chronic illness reversal undercuts corporate profits. Zero sum. If it was normal for our doctors and our board certified nutritionists and things like that, if it was normal and largely practiced for them to engage in preventive medicine and chronic illness reversal, that would obliterate corporate profits to a significant degree. You'd have a healthier population, but you'd have a lot less profit funneling into the health insurance companies, funneling into the pharmaceutical companies, funneling into the hospitals, etc. If you have a healthier population, then you have less money being spent on health care. Right? Your doctors may not even really know this or be cognizant of it. It's kind of like um, how police in the United States are known for police brutality. It's culture. It's institution. When you go through the institution, the deeper you get into the institution, you surrender to the institution. And the next thing you know, you're practicing certain behaviors that you may not necessarily have been doing before. It's insidious. Right? It kind of creeps in. And next thing you know, the system has you and you're engaging in brutality unnecessarily as a police officer, right? It's not really the individuals, it's the system itself that really you gotta put the onus on. <clears throat> Your doctor is not really allowed to practice, you know, reversing chronic illnesses or preventative healthcare. They're not trained to do that, they're not really, it's not in the culture. Right? Western, especially with Western medicine largely driven by profit, it's not in the culture. Right? They got to get you on the amlodipine, the hydrochlorothiazide. They got to get you on the beta blockers. Right? They got to get you on the steroids, the hormone replacements, the diuretics. Right? They got to get you on the antidepressants, the SSRIs, these types of things. Right? Get you on the medications, keep you on the medications. And if you ask, well, how long do I have to take this medication? You're more than likely going to get an answer of, well, let's see how things go. Or, well, you know, we, we can't really determine that right now. We'll just keep an eye on it. There's no time frame. The reason why is because the answer is you ain't getting off. There's no intent to get you off. There's no deadline. There's no, there's no solution. They keep you in the game, but you're not going to win, right? Ultimately, the natural conclusion, you know, often leads to, let's say, kidney disease and dialysis, right? which is often the case for a lot of our population. I've spoken to enough doctors to know that they don't even really realize the things that I'm even saying. They don't really notice. <clears throat> because not everybody's going to engage in this kind of systemic analysis.
I may be hyper aware of it because I just think like that. It doesn't, I don't think it makes me special. I think a lot of people think like this, which is why you'll have a lot of doctors who decide they're going to do things in an entirely different way. And they're going to open a private practice and do things fundamentally different. And health insurance companies are not covering what they do. Holistic practitioners, things like that. And unfortunately for them, you had to go to them and pay them out of pocket. Which is a bit of a confirmation of what I'm saying, or a big confirmation of what I'm saying. <clears throat> in the United States in particular, 18% of our GDP is spent on healthcare spending. It's a huge amount. Enormous amount of money. The amount of money that uh, health insurance brings in uh, that accounts for our GDP is like in between 6 and 8%. Significant. That's just health insurance. When you factor in hospitals and pharmaceuticals and whatnot, it's much greater than that. So if you undercut the profits, this is going to uh, have a very negative impact on uh, the stock market. And that will hurt GDP, it'll hurt the stock market, uh, and there's going to be a lot of political pressure that the donors are going to apply onto our political class as a result. This is very destabilizing. If you, a, if you get a healthier population, it would literally hurt these sectors of our economy just by having a healthier population. Right? Just having a healthier population would hurt profits of the institutions that we rely on, that we call health care. Right? People often call it a sick care system. <clears throat> I don't know if it necessarily was intended to be this way from the beginning, but it definitely became this way. And you can say that this is a critique of capitalism, which is our economic model that we have here, right? That would be valid, right? Because the system is organized for profit. Obviously, if it was organized, if our healthcare system was organized to produce the best health results or the best health outcomes, well, it would be a massive failure, right? Because the more money we spend on our healthcare, that goes parallel to worse outcomes. So we get worse outcomes and we spend more money and then worse outcomes even more so and then more money and worse outcomes. It's just going in the wrong direction. What we should see is if we put more money into our healthcare system, we should be seeing better outcomes, not worse. Right, so things are trending in the wrong direction. It's almost like getting a uh, healthier population is not the goal. Right? But the profits are, are going in, in the right direction. So. The system obviously organized for profits, and this is how this works, right? So this would really demonstrate to you why what I tell you to do may be extremely different from what your nutritionist or your doctor tells you to do. So for example, if you have diabetes, type 2 diabetes, you go to your doctor, and your doctor says, make sure we're going to cut back your carbohydrates and try to avoid fruit because fruit has, is high in sugar. So you want to avoid fruit as much as possible because of the sugar, right? And eat more protein, they'll tell you. Eat more protein, eat less carbs, and avoid fruit because of the sugar. They'll never tell you about the glycemic index. Well, I won't say never, but they hardly ever tell you about the glycemic index. They never talk about glycemic load. They never even talk about the benefits of fruit uh, uh, in your diet and how it improves insulin sensitivity and reverses type 2 diabetes. They never tell you about it. There's plenty of empirical data. There's plenty of statistical and epidemiological data that would demonstrate that, but they just they don't really tell you about it. All right. Um, and you can't have... People tell them the truth about what actually causes type 2 diabetes. Because if you did, well, um, that would undercut the profits of uh, animal agriculture, which is our largest like agricultural industries, right? 
So all of that meat, dairy, and eggs, and all this type of stuff, those are big money makers. And if it becomes common knowledge that the primary driver of mitochondrial uh, dis disorder and insulin resistance is saturated fat and excess protein, guess what happens? People are going to go, oh, for real, so if I'm a diabetic, I should avoid these things? Or if I'm insulin resistant, I should avoid these things? Or if I have non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, I should avoid these things? Or if I have kidney disease, I should consume less protein and avoid animal products? and lower the amount of oxidative stress going on in my liver and my kidneys as a result of these things. Oh, I should stop cooking with the palm oil and all of this type of stuff. Oh, the dairy consumption actually puts your kids at risk for developing type 1 diabetes. If, you, if you're a pregnant, woman, uh, a pregnant mother or a pregnant woman and you're consuming dairy, you, can in, you increase the likelihood of your kids having uh, chronic illnesses, one of them being type 1 diabetes. If this was common general knowledge in our population, guess how much that would hurt the profit margins of these industries? Right? So it's not really talked about. It's easy to demonize sugar because it's already addicting anyway. Right? So people say, oh, you gotta cut sugar out of your diet as much as possible. That's easy to say because it's addicting. It's kind of like, Tobacco companies do very well with selling cigarettes and all of that type of stuff, and everybody knows cigarettes are well, do, or, you know, cigarettes are terrible. You got plenty of people smoking cigarettes, and cigarette companies make a ton of money because it's addicting. Right? You can have an opioid epidemic even though people know, hey, this stuff is terrible for your health and it'll destroy your life. When it's addicting, you can say whatever you want about it. You can't get people, people off of it. However, when it comes to like meat, dairy, and eggs, not so much. It doesn't have that addictive effect. People don't even actually like the taste of meat. People don't like the taste of meat. People don't, really, people don't like the taste of eggs. People don't like the taste of these things. And I know people don't like the taste of these things. Because if, I, because if you were to say to me, if I tell you, you don't like the taste of chicken, and you say, well, yeah, like, I like the taste of chicken. I'm like, oh, word, what I want you to do is get a chicken breast and boil it and eat it unseasoned. And the first thing that would come to your mind is, ah, I'm not doing that. That's disgusting. Oh, you like the taste of eggs? Crack an egg, swallow the yolk whole. Ugh, it's disgusting. Even if you boil an egg, you eat egg whites. This isn't, ooh, yummy, tasty, hard-boiled eggs. Doesn't taste good. Right? We eat these things culturally. So, if you want to know who's in power, guess who you get in trouble for talking about? Right? You can't talk about them. Even there's certain things here on this platform that we call YouTube, there's certain things you can't talk about because they'll pull your channel down, right? You get, real, you get funny about certain things. You got to pay attention to that. So, moral of the story is It's not really your doctor's fault whether they give you bad information. They've been given bad information. The question is, who's giving the bad information? Who's responsible for giving the bad information? The head of the systems is the one that's producing these outcomes. We live in a, we live in a top-down system. Right? So you got to take a magnifying glass and take it to the ones that are at the top of the system. And that's, that's a systemic analysis. That's, a, that, that's what gives us a clearer understanding of what's going on. All right. How we doing, folks? We got any questions or anything like that? <clears throat> doing pretty good on time with, with explaining all of that. You know what I mean? So, want to keep it short and sweet with that. We're going to dive into some stuff about health and wellness and our food choices. All right. We are a little light tonight. Folks are showing up late. They missed that first segment. 
So you're just going to have to catch that on the replay. Kelly White, what's going on? Good to see you in here. I've been a nurse for 32 years, and it's so sad to see the healthcare is now a business. Yeah. D, what's going on? Sorry so late. Hey, it's all good. You know what I'm saying? You'll be able to catch the replay. No worries. I'm posted in the Discord. But yeah, for my folks working in the healthcare industry, you know what I'm talking about. And you know what? Um, I've spoken to a lot of nutritionists, and they're like, you know what? I don't even feel like I don't want to do it anymore. Um, you know, I've spoken to a lot of nurses. They're like, I don't, I don't even want to do it anymore. Any, anymore. Doctors, this mass exodus from the healthcare system. You wouldn't believe. Mass exodus. Um, health, care, health insurance companies, they're painting your backside. They hamstring you. Right? You can be like, hey, the clinical data says this. Health insurance companies are like, we're not covering that. You have to prescribe this medication, period. Got to do it. Somebody comes into your office and they got high blood pressure, you got to put them on these pills. You got to. Right? Ali, what's going on? Good to see you in here. Do you, do you think ever in our lifetime the system will be overturned or frantically changed and eventually the masses will come together to make change. Uh, in our lifetime, probably not. <laughs> um, I think that in our lifetime, we're setting the foundation uh, to see really significant change moving on in the future. I think that, um, so people like me, I'm not the only one saying these kinds of messages. Um, but, you know, people like me talk about this stuff and give this kind of systemic critique and explain to folks what's going on. And, you know, our population, you know, when I first started off, 18 years old as a personal trainer, you work with people. The chronic illness isn't so prevalent. It's not like every person who's in the gym there who needs help. They all got high blood pressure, diabetes. Uh, atherosclerosis, you know, they've had a stroke or two, heart attack, whatever the case is. Now, this is just like, it's just normal. It's like every other person. It's astonishing. Right? I mean, you just have women walking around, Hashimoto's, PCOS, hypothyroidism, fibroids, um, MS, I mean, all types of stuff. Right? You got young men in their 20s walking around, erectile dysfunction. Right, you got a you got erectile dysfunction and low testosterone destroying marriages. Right, um, men's sex drive getting destroyed. Right, having all types of heart attacks and strokes and, and uh, anxiety, depression, and all of this type of stuff. And it's it, it's getting so prevalent now. Um, and that whole breakout that happened. You know, and 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 during the uh, the demic, right? It it got even worse after that. And so we're experiencing like a real wake up call. And it's got people talking, like I'm doing now. And it's we have to decide that we're 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 cutting out. We're opting out. A lot of people do this. A lot of people are like, look. My doctors, you know, they try to give me these pills. I'm like, I'm just not taking them. I'm, doing, I'm going a different way. Um, people with cancer, I've had people with cancer. They're like, I'm not doing the chemo. I'm not doing, I'm not getting nothing cut out. I'm not doing it. Went a different way. Uh, I just did an interview uh, for a podcast, right? My man, Harold, where uh, he reversed his cancer, plant-based. Right, plant-based and juicing, and reverses cancer. If he would have done it the Western medicine way, the conventional way, he might not be here today. Right. So we can go to the grocery store. If you got land, you can grow your own medicine. You can go to the grocery store, you can get your own fruits, vegetables, things like this. And you can heal yourself. And we still have that opportunity to do that. We got to use it while we got it. 
We've become a quick fix society. I mean, this is true to the point where we don't know anything else other than the quick fix. And it's true, right? Uh, and and that that is uh, the culture. But the culture is it, it's from the top down. Right? I mean, it's, it's this top down culture, right? It's astroturf, as they say. Uh, and so we got to respond to that with a grassroots response, right? Going back to the days of the Bush doctor. Uh, there is a short video that I'm going to do that I'm going that I'm going to drop tomorrow. I'm going to put on TikTok talking about how to fix candida. All right. Candida is one of those things where people are just like, I don't know what causes it. And I've tried so many things. I don't know how to fix it. Um, and so I'm going to talk about that because there is a pretty straightforward fix to it that um, most people don't know. It's not, it's not really a medication you can take for it. Uh, you know, the natural means work the best. With any, with any fungal infection, you have to disrupt its ability to proliferate inside your system and spread. Your immune system cannot fight fungal infection the way that it fights other things. So the, fung so the, the, the fungus has this protection, right? Take candida, for example. It has a biofilm. And this biofilm is like this mucousy substance that protects and shields it. It keeps your immune system from destroying it. And this is what preserves its ability to proliferate throughout your gut. Right? So things like mold poisoning, things like candida, right? This type of thing. You need some help. So herbs and spices are some things that would be your best shot. Garlic, ginger, oregano, cinnamon, for example, right? Coconut oil, black seed oil, right? Pure 100% olive oil. Things like that are some of, your, some of your best options to reverse that kind of thing, right? You season your food with it. Don't cook oil, though. That's the caveat. Don't cook oil. You cook it, you put it under high temperatures, you oxidize it, it becomes rancid, causes oxidative stress, damage to your liver, um, vascular constriction, jacks up your blood pressure. No good. If you're going to do the oil, you got to do it in a raw form. You swallow it in a small quantity, like a teaspoon or something like this. Your herbs and spices, you can either season your food with it, you can drink it in a tea or take it in a capsule. And you do it periodically throughout the day. You can use three of them, four of them, or all of them, right? And space them out throughout the day. And you do that, you get rid of your infection. But, you, but that the, the disruption of the biofilm, right? This is the reason why this works in the first place. You inhibit its ability to proliferate and spread. If you go to your doctor with that or your nutritionist with that, they may not even know to tell you that. More than likely, they'll give you some pills or something. Now, the thing in particular that's insidious is the whole candida problem, right? I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but just enough, because I've had people ask me about it. Well, what causes it? Because people say, oh, well, they say it's caused by sugar. Or they say it's caused by eating bread. People say these kinds of things. Because, you know, they hear somebody say something, and they go, oh, I heard. There are a handful of things that are primarily responsible for these fungal overgrowths, right? Or, or this yeast infections, right? These kinds of things. This is why I'm not a big fan of eating, you know, all types of bread and past, pastas and, and pastries and things like this, right? Because you get an overaccumulation of yeast in your gut. It becomes problematic, especially if you're insulin resistant. Primary causes, right? Antibiotics is number one. Antibiotics, okay, absolutely avoid them like the plague. They will destroy your gut health like you wouldn't believe, okay? And repeated and long-term use of antibiotics, absolutely devastated. 
And it's been pumped into our animal agriculture to such a degree that you end up getting all types of chronic illness and development and, and autoimmune issues and things like that just from eating the animal products or loaded up with all the antibiotics. Just by proxy. Right? Can men be infected with or by candida also? As far as I know, yes. Um, so antibiotics. Then you got steroids. Let's say you, a lot of times people use steroids. Not People think, oh, steroids, bodybuilders to get jacked or performance athletes. No. Most steroids are actually used to fight like autoimmune issues. Okay, so if you have, like, let's say, eczema or lupus or asthma, something like this, right? They'll use a steroid of some sort for it. Steroids contribute to this in a variety of ways. Number one, it contributes to the destruction of your gut, but also steroids, especially long-term use, causes insulin resistance. Another contributor, big major contributor, birth control. All right. Disrupting the balance between your estrogen and progesterone. Big mistake. Okay. Um, birth control is like number three on the list. Cause you to gain all kind of weight because, because you get this excessive estrogen and, and the blocking of progesterone. And, you know, it's, it's these hormones are directly correlated to each other. They're codependent. You, you're going to create a massive imbalance between them. You're going to get all kinds of problems, right? Um, this is often correlated to endometriosis. All right. Endometriosis is also something that I'm going to talk about more in the future. Everybody give a big shout out to the, the first lady of the tribe. Or my happy healthing or... Uh, on YouTube is forever faithful on to him. So what else? We, we, got, we got antibiotics, we got steroids, we got birth control, we got estrogen replacement therapy, uh, which kind of goes hand in hand with the birth control thing. Um, and that also goes with the steroid thing also, depending on what kind of steroids you take, you may need to supplement with estrogen replacement therapy. And then you have insulin resistance. And insulin resistance causes you to have excess blood sugar. And the excess blood sugar, especially combined with something like excess yeast, creates yeast infections, creates issues like candida, fungal overgrowths, this kind of thing. All right? So insulin resistance, excess yeast, boom. That's, that's the cocktail right there. All right? Uh, and then alcohol consumption is also up there. There's more things than that, but those are like the, the primary things. So when people say, oh, well, you got to try to eat less sugar because of the candida, because, you know, avoid sugar or carbs or whatever, because it feeds the candida, it causes candida or fungal overgrowth, like a SIBO or something like that. When the truth is, it's not the carbs or the sugar in themselves that does it. It's the insulin resistance. Right? So, for example, something like, like two spices, like cinnamon or ginger, right? These things, yes, they're antibacterial, they're antifungal, they're antiviral, um, but they also improve insulin sensitivity and reverse insulin resistance. That's why they're so effective. Oregano also. Right? Um, and then, you know, the coconut oil antifungal, antibacterial, antiviral as well. Black seed oil, same thing. Right? And olive oil, I believe, also, same thing. Right? Ali, let's see, I'm learning more about the ancient African diet, which I'm learning seems to be a high plant-based diet. I grew up in the South, and soul food is such a part of the culture. It's shocking to learn about. Yeah. 
Uh, look, us melanated folks. Plant-based diet is where it's at, period. Plant-based diet is where it's at. Your fruits, your vegetables, your herbs, your spices, your lentils, your yams, your cabbage, that's where it's at. Absolutely. Um, so yeah, and then of course, oh yeah, excess dietary yeast. That's the, that'd be like the final thing, touching on the, the fungus thing. So all these breads and pastries and stuff wreck your gut. Okay, don't do it. And especially don't eat things like that if you're insulin resistant, because you're going to have all kinds of problems. Don't do it. Nope, nope, nope. Absolutely not. Moving on. Are we ready to talk about what to eat to improve mental health and motivation? Well, this is going to be a bit of a deep one. So put a one in the chat if you're ready, if you're ready for that one. If you got any other questions, we'll get to that before I start. Monday Night Live is popping, y'all. We get into the business. Monday Night Live, we get into the business, y'all. All right, we got the ones in here. All right. Okay. Mental and emotional wellness have an intrinsic relationship with motivation. Motivation is a thing that's very important. You don't gain it from a speech. Motivation really should be called agitation, kind of. Right? So, like, um, picture wildness out in the street, civil unrest, people picket signs protesting, they're throwing stuff at cops, whatever the case is, right? Bugging out. They're throwing rocks and bricks at the riot shields. The public's fed up. They had enough. And there's always a guy with a bullhorn shouting stuff in the bullhorn. Arms flailing, gesticulating, right, in the bullhorn. Now that guy on the bullhorn is called an agitator, right? Egging the people on. And so they're all fired up and, and whatnot and ready to go and drop kick some riot shields because they're, they're, they're agitated. But in actuality, it's not really agitation in the way that we think about it. It's a form of motivation. The bullhorn can be your internal dialogue that goes on in your mind. Right. In our lives, we have the inner agitator. We got that guy gesticulating with the bullhorn. Right. You know how like um, there's a little cartoon and there's the angel and on one shoulder and the devil on the other. Well, in our lives, we got the we got the agitator in our ear with the bullhorn. And the agitator in our ear, the bullhorn. It's like let's get up, let's get it, let's do it, let's. Let's get this workout in. Let's get these reps in. Last week, we got nine. We're going to get a solid 10 or 11 when we get up in here. Let's go. Meal prep. Let's go. Let's get busy. Let's do this. We're on the right track. Let's get it. Right? And then throw in some arm pumping and gesticulation. I keep using the word gesticulation because I really like that word. Gesticulation doesn't sound like what it means. <laughs> you heard the word gesticulate, you wouldn't know what that means. <laughs> so, the agitator only exists in certain circumstances, though. Right? There has to be the underlying conditions that meets that, that whole thing. There has to be a need, and then there has to be the belief in achieving the need. You need those things. So in your mind as a person, you have a set of goals. Let's say you want to get to your goal weight. You want to build muscle density, bone density. You want to get better health. You want to shed inches, body fat. You want physiological freedom, right? Chronic illness reversal. You want to feel better, sleep better. You want to feel more confidence, right? You want to supercharge your life. 
you want to be you want to be metabolically bulletproof right metabolically bulletproof that's a good term i like that metabolically bulletproof i like that term i'm gonna have to write some copy with that term in there how to be metabolically bulletproof so you have these things that you want but then how do you frame them in your mind do you think those things are possible do you think they're accessible right that becomes the question. If you don't think these things are possible and you don't think they're accessible, that's, that's going to... Because the agitator ain't going to be agitating knowing people don't want to hear it. Right? Because the agitator ain't going to be there on the bullhorn carrying on, shouting into the bullhorn and people leaving and going home. Right? It's demoralizing. So how do you frame these things in your head when you say them? Do you feel it's achievable? Are you working towards these goals out of anger? Is it joy? Are you excited? Do you feel like you're getting closer with every step of action you take? What's going on mentally? That's how you frame it in your head. Now let's dig in a little bit further. What are your thoughts made of? Ooh, now this is where this gets interesting because... You can give all the motivational speeches you want, but I'm telling you right now, somebody, if you are not susceptible, if you're not ready to hear the message, you will not receive it. Right? You'll see motivational speeches all over YouTube and whatnot, and they'll do well and get all types of views and blow up and everything. They go viral and stuff like crazy. But it's only because the people listening to it, they clicked on it and they wanted to hear it. But somebody in your personal life, they can't just get up in your face and be like, you owe you an explanation, right? They'd be like, Yo, chill, stop. It's early in the morning. I'm tired. Get out of my face. Doesn't work. So what are your thoughts made out of? It's not motivational speeches or whatever. What are your thoughts made out of? Your thoughts are made out of chemicals and neurotransmitters. That's really what's going on. Us as human beings, we're just like a blob of like chemicals and just biochemical reactions and the stuff blowing up and surging and going all over the place. So what's happening in your body. Cells are splitting off and merging and eating each other and being eaten and all types of explosions and electrical charges going up and down nerves. It's just chaos. It's all type of craziness going on. That's what we're made out of. A whole bunch of cells moving around, fidgeting and scrambling all over the place, doing stuff. Your thoughts are made out of serotonin, dopamine, endorphins, right? They're made out of adrenaline. They're made out of the amino acids that create the neurotransmitters or that are used to create the neurotransmitters so that you can get the chemical reactions that facilitate these things that we call thoughts. Right? Your thoughts start in your food. Where do they start? Your thoughts start with your food. So here's a great example, okay? If you want to know, hey, what do I eat? What is one thing that I can eat that would improve my brain chemistry and get me more motiv motivated? Four to eight bananas a day. Great habit. Four to eight bananas a day. Four to eight. So why bananas? Why? Magnesium, potassium, tryptophan, glycine, manganese, vitamin C, and B vitamins. Not to mention a ton of glucose that'll flood your cells with, avail with, with all types of available energy. That's what. Tryptophan, for example, is an amino acid that is the precursor to serotonin. Most of your gut, uh, most of your serotonin exists and is synthesized in your gut. It's like 70% of it, at least. Right? And so you eat these foods and you get all of this sauce and digestion and metabolism going on in your gut. 
and that tryptophan gets used to create all this serotonin and you feel good in your gut. And you know when you feel good in your gut. Because when you eat things that don't feel any good in your gut, your gut feels distressed. You get a food baby, you get all type of air, you get this balloon belly, you go from having an any belly button to an Audi, right? And you stick out, right? Maybe you get some gas, bloating, right? All type of flatulence, right? So you go to sleep at night, you fart in your sleep, your covers are floating over the bed, right? Because they're just, they're just rocket fuel coming out of your backside, pushing the covers all over the place, right? You're bombing your spouse in their sleep, right? Having flatulation wars, right? Just flogging each other with rocket fuel all night, right? That's a, that is distressed gut. Airing it out, right? And if you have a relationship that's healthy and it's beautiful, y'all can laugh about it together, rub your bellies, fart all loud and stuff, right? This is not about farting. I'm just talking about distress gut. I don't want to be too animated about it, right? But when your gut feels good, your stomach feels flat, you got a lot of energy and rocket fuel in your brain rather than in your gut and coming out your butt cheeks, right? Some people are like, well, bananas don't work with me. That's fine. You may be a special case. You could, we can find something else for you. It's going to be all right. But in general, generally speaking, bananas is great. That magnesium, right? And your body uses the resources there to make that glycine from the bananas that you eat. And things like tryptophan and glycine together are amino acids that are extremely important to your brain chemistry. And then you tie those amino acids in with magnesium and manganese. You tie these things together. This is a soup. It's a recipe for optimal brain health, brain chemistry. This will drive you out of that anxiety and depression. Whenever you hear like fruitarians and stuff, and they just loading up on all of this fruit, high raw vegan diet, they're like, man, I feel great. I got energy. I sleep well. I got all of this energy. They keep saying this. I got mental clarity and energy, mental energy and clarity. I feel like I can get up and go. I wake up in the morning feeling refreshed, all this stuff, blah, blah, blah. Why is that? Because all the foods are just loaded up with vitamin C and all these feel-good hormones like serotonin. So that serotonin gets synthesized in the brain, right? And then that's the precursor for melatonin that allows you to get some good sleep at night, right? And you can track it, right? The amount of magnesium you get will determine what your sleep quality is like. It'll determine how your day goes. It'll determine how much muscle you grow from your workouts. It'll determine bone density. This stuff's a big deal. One of the biggest things that have aided me so far in building you know, muscle and creating a body transformation is intentionally increasing magnesium. Right? Both through food and supplementation. If you train hard, your floor goes from being 400 milligrams of magnesium per day to like 700. Right? Human beings are, are, are able to eat a tremendous amount of food. The way that you do this typically is by having a high carbohydrate diet. Right? Eating the rocket fuel. So with all these minerals and these essential amino acids like the ones that I named... If you improve your mental stability, if you improve the level of serotonin you have, that, cas that has cascading effects. When you improve your insulin sensitivity by having better blood flow from the extra vitamin C, B vitamins, iron, copper, magnesium, manganese, all this stuff, you have all of that in your diet and you improve your blood flow and you improve your insulin sensitivity, you get less oxidative stress in your body. You get better gut health, which leads to more serotonin development. And then that, in turn, leads into all of that. Just you feel better in your mind. You have more clarity because you're literally decongesting your gut, your colon, your liver, etc. You put less strain on your kidneys. So your body overall just ends up being under less stress, which means that you're liberated. You're now, you're now free to pursue your life and your goals, right? You get an increase in growth hormone. You get an increase in brain-derived neurotropic factor. 
you get an increase in dopamine sensitivity. Dopamine is one of the most important currencies of life. Dopamine is your is the motivation hormone. It's the encouragement hormone. It is the hormone that gives you the feeling that that a goal is worthy of pursuing. That's what dopamine does. Dopamine makes the difference between whether or not you want to cross the finish line. You can't even enjoy your food without dopamine. If your dopamine receptors are shot, you can eat your favorite food and just not feel anything. Like, I, I shouldn't have even ate that. I don't feel anything from it. i give you an example. Let's say Belgium waffles are your favorite food. You can take them. So when I, for me, I'm, and this is me, okay. I haven't eaten a Belgian waffle in quite a while. But before I was vegan, before I was plant-based, my favorite thing to eat was these giant Belgian waffles. It's these big waffles that cover, that cover up the whole plate. And I would do the gross, I would do the most gross stuff you've ever seen with a Belgian waffle. It was gross. We're talking massive amounts of syrup, butter, and cream slathered all over this thing. To the point where I was eating a Belgian waffle with my cream and syrup and butter. Wild. But it was so good, I would eat it. No fruit. No. This was before my fruiting days. But if I did that every day, I would no longer enjoy that food. It would ruin it for me. I'd get tired of it. it you pick your favorite food. It doesn't matter what it is. If you eat it every single day, eventually you get tired of it. Now imagine not only you ate it every single day, but it's all you ate. So imagine every meal is Belgian waffles. You'd be like, oh my God, I'm tired of Belgian waffles. I'm tired of it. I don't just want to eat, please, I just want to eat something else. I'm sick of Belgian waffles. Right? Because what happens is when you keep tapping the, the dopamine button, you keep tapping, you keep pressing that button, the button becomes less responsive. It's like an old TV remote. You keep pressing the same button and it doesn't really respond. So you press it harder and harder and harder. And the more you press the button and the harder you press the button, the more you wear it out and the button just stops working. And then you get pissed off and angry at the controller and then you don't even want to use the controller anymore. That's like your brain. When the dopamine button stops responding, you start pressing it harder and harder and harder. And if you don't get a response, you just stop pressing the button and then you don't enjoy anything anymore. And then you no longer have the desire to do anything anymore. And then you lose all of your desire. You lose all your motivation because no goal is worthy because that dopamine is the thing that gives you the feeling of satisfaction and reward from pursuing and achieving that goal. Now, food choices, the beautiful thing about your food choices is natural food choices that are often in a high raw vegan diet, they're satiating, but they don't smash the crap out of your dopamine button. They're very well regulated. You can get the sweetest of fruits, like a mango, right? But nobody binge eats b mangoes. Nobody binge eats bananas. You, it's, it's satisfying and you know how many to eat because you stop. You get full and you stop. It's good enough. And it's not overly sweet where it's going to rot your teeth and all of this type of stuff. You're going to get obese. You're going to be a sugar addict and just an absolute lunatic, right? It's not going to happen because this stuff's tightly regulated. There's a very big difference between a Krispy Kreme donut and a mango, okay? The amino acids, the mineral balance, the vitamins, all the nutrients, the water, it's worlds apart, not even close. So when you see people, they want to equate just like sugary junk food and fruit. Oh, sugar. These people, don't listen to these people because they don't know what you're talking about. To equate these things takes a gratuitous level of laziness. Right? It's like stripping the alphabet of like three-fourths of the letters. It's, it's, it's shameful, right, to, to speak in this kind of way. But in any case... You get this high raw vegan diet that's just loaded up, mineral dense, vitamin and amino acid dense, which means every food you eat, it is now fixing that dopamine button. It's improving the sensitivity, keyword sensitivity. In the same way you need insulin sensitivity is in the same way you need dopamine sensitivity. So that high raw vegan diet, 
those fruits, those leafy greens, those herbs and spices, that bitter tea. Bitter tea don't taste great, but I don't add sweeteners to my teas. One of the best decisions I ever made. Embrace the bitterness of the teas. Right? When you embrace the bitterness, you get used to it. So then when you eat something sweet, it's even more satisfying than before. All of these things combine, and I have a 100% success rate of getting people to mental and emotional wellness and getting them off of their medications for anxiety and depression. 100% success rate. Everybody who's come to me, anxiety, depression, they're on medications for this stuff. I've been, uh, I've been able to guide them to mental liberation 100% of the time. I'm, I'm not exaggerating. It's a 100% success rate. If they did what I told them to do, 100% success rate. Guaranteed, right? We got the formula. We know exactly how it works. You can eat your way out. What's going on, brother? Vidya. Yeah, I used to remember past actions by people around me and views on me. Respected, sir. Very nice. What types of raw fruits for better gut health issues with RBC issues, with liver health issues? Okay, gotcha. So here's, here's some things to eat for better mental health. I just wanted to give all the context up front, right? Now let's talk brass tacks. We talk about food. So the first thing I named was like the four to eight bananas, okay? Second choice is going to be like two to, four, two to four large mangoes. Okay, all those mangoes. By the way, about mangoes. Mangoes, you slice up mangoes, you get the flesh of the mango, you put it in a blender and blend it up. And you add a little bit of water. It is the most beautiful, smooth texture, sweet. It's amazing. Unbelievable. Mango smoothie, just straight mango smoothie. Absolutely amazing. All right. Uh, but in any case, yeah, I got, I'm on a, I'm, I got a real mango kick. I'm, I'm serious about mangoes. So bananas, mangoes, then you got cantaloupe, right? Notice, notice these things have that beta carotene, that yellow and orange pigmentation that is the precursor to vitamin A. And vitamin A is extraordinarily important for your mental and emotional well-being, which is the substrate for motivation. Pumpkin seed kernels. Great source of tryptophan, iron, copper, zinc, magnesium, manganese. It's like the Swiss army knife of mental wellness and reversing chronic illness, right? Pumpkin seed kernels. Ideally, you want to get them roasted. Makes it easier for them to, to digest them. Brazil nuts. Selenium. Phenomenal source of selenium, which is extremely important for your immune system, your nervous system, and your brain chemistry. Brazil nuts. It may be a little, pri little pricey, a little expensive. Definitely worth it. And all you need, about four to six of them a day. Almonds. Roasted almonds. It's another one. Rich in iron, copper, magnesium, manganese. Potassium, selenium, all the minerals. Big deal. That's another one. So you know, fruits and nuts, <laughs> essentially. Fruits and nuts, all right? Fruits and nuts. Absolutely amazing combinations here. Grapes, loads of vitamin C and antioxidants, right? Polyphenol. Important amino acids like malic acid. Malic acid is a big deal for brain chemistry and digestive health. Okay? Malic acid, primarily found in, well, yeah, exclusively, I believe, found in vegetables. Okay? Malic acid is extremely important for your nervous system, skin health, um, digestive health, right? Actually regulating your stomach acids. By the way, which also prevents things like SIBO, candida, right? These fungal overgrowths, yeast infections, very important. 
right? That malic acid you get from them grapes. Grapes very important uh, for mental health, testosterone, blood flow, muscular contractions, loaded with vitamin C, potassium, all the important minerals needed, water, right? Citrulline also, dilate your vascular system. Glycine, right, which is needed for the maintenance of your liver. What's interesting enough is you got the citrulline, the malic acid, and the glycine, and these things combined literally help to fortify and protect your liver. So if you've got non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, you're insulin resistant, diabetic, or whatever the case is, these amino acids provide a massive benefit. Apples. People talk about an apple a day keeps a doctor away. Well, you know what? You can get like a good three or four apples. Okay. Honeycrisp, Gala apples, Pink Lady, Fuji apples, Golden Crisp. Just some of my favorites. Granny Smith. Granny Smith, great, great uh, apples. Uh, and apples are actually the, the, I believe it's the richest source of malic acid. And malic acid combined with magnesium supercharges brain health as well as muscle growth and bone density. That's, that, that's important to know right there, right? So apples, sure, apples may seem a bit basic, but it's extremely important. Cherries. Cherries are real expensive, but you know what? They're worth the price. Cherries are a big deal. Make sure you don't swallow the pits, right? Then you got broccoli, peas, lentils, cabbage, kale, right? Basically your leafy greens, sprouted greens. Extraordinarily benefit, right? Extraordinary benefit, extraordinarily beneficial for your mental health. So all of these foods combine, right? So you get your fruits throughout the day. And then you end off with, you know, your lentils, your leafy greens, and then boom, you got yourself a beautiful high raw vegan diet, right? You get an abundance of your beta carotene, your vitamin C loaded up, magnesium, all this stuff all day. Just a straight up medicinal diet, supercharging your brain. You supercharge your brain, that just improves everything else straight across the board. Those foods those nutrients are the building blocks of your inner agitator a little mini you with a bullhorn flailing the arms and gesticulating arm pumping All right so that's essentially um how that works as a goal you should try to get a minimum of 400 milligrams per day of magnesium from your diet, minimum, right? And if you're struggling mentally and emotionally, supplement with a chelated form of magnesium. My number one is magnesium glycinate, which is basically magnesium combined with glycine. If you eat a high raw vegan diet, it'd be really easy to get an abundance of glycine. But if you get that supplementation, it will help, definitely. If you are insulin resistant, so you've got fatty liver disease, any kind of metabolic disorder, and you're struggling mentally and emotionally, or you're on some type of SSRI or whatever the case is, that magnesium glycinate will change your world. And then you can supplement with 200 to 400 milligrams per day. Uh, I'm a big fan of doing two grams of magnesium malate in the earlier portion of the day and two grams of magnesium glycinate before bed. Great recipe. So you improve your insulin sensitivity, you improve your gut health, your liver health, you improve your blood flow, brain chemistry, everything just running uh, beautifully. By the way, I mentioned, uh, did I mention this or did I mean to mention this? Earlier in the day, I meant to mention endometriosis. Uh, if you have a debilitating menstrual cycle, if you have endometriosis, you got fiber, I mean fibroids, 
excessive thickening of the uterine lining. The reason why a high fruit diet is so beneficial is because the magnesium, the malic acid, the citrulline, and the vitamin C literally helps to, to rebalance your female reproductive system and hormones. Right, so that's, that's a little bonus feature that I wanted to mention there. All right. Let me catch up with y'all on these comments here. By the way, folks, hit the like button. You know what I'm saying? Like the stream if you like the stream. Right, so we can pump this thing up in the algorithm a little bit. So let's see, let me catch up with y'all with some of these comments, with some of these questions in here. Let's see. Ali. I read that the fruits we eat today have been modified over the years, and the best fruits to eat are the seeded. How true is that? Which are sort of seeded fruits like grapes and bananas. Are hard to find. Yeah, um, so basically, people say this thing about like, oh, you know, you shouldn't eat a fruit or whatever because it's a hybrid form and things like that. All biological life forms on the planet today are hybrids. That includes fruits, vegetables, any organic matter on the planet. Any organic species on the planet is a hybrid version of a previous version. All right. The longer something exists, the more genetic mutations it goes through. And then with each genetic mutation, it gradually becomes something else. Then you can have uh, one, one vegetable grow next to another vegetable and create a hybrid that way. You can have one fruit grow next to another fruit or on top of another fruit and you get a brand new fruit that way. Um, whether it has, for, there, by the way, there is no such thing as a seedless fruit. It's not a thing. It doesn't exist. It's not, there's no such thing as a seedless fruit. Let's say you look at like your conventional yellow banana, right? That we know. If you crack a banana in half, you look in the middle, you'll see these black specks. Those black specks are seeds. There's two different types of seeds in fruit, typically. Mature seeds and immature seeds. Immature seeds are often very small. Sometimes they're, they're difficult to see, uh, but they're not hard. They're often soft, sometimes translucent, that type of thing. Mature seeds are hard and rather large. Right? So what you're talking about is mature seeds. There isn't really any evidence that I've seen um, that shows any kind of negative effect from eating fruits that don't have a substantial amount of mature seeds. Right, so I wouldn't really be too concerned with that. The only concern I would really probably have is like, you know, pesticides um, to toxic degrees. I'm not a big fan of the chemical pesticide stuff. When you see these people walking through a field with a hazmat suit on, spraying crops with chemicals, that is all kind, that is stomach churning to me. That's all kinds of problematic. Why is that? They know this stuff is so hazardous. They got to wear a, a, a damn Chernobyl suit to even be around the stuff, to even be spraying it. What's the hazmat suit for if it's safe? We don't like that. <laughs> right? Um, that's just one of the you know, uh, consequences of the world that we live in right now with, you know, with our agriculture. It would make more sense to grow our agriculture in a glass dome that's fully insulated so that, like, you can't get all types of pests inside. Then you wouldn't need the pesticides. I'm a big fan of the big, the, the big, the glass dome greenhouse. You get that glass dome greenhouse. The glass pretty much puts the sun rays on steroids. And then you get some nice big fat giant crops right and then you can you can uh get a better nitrogen content in the soil you can be more selective about the soil that you use to grow the crops so you get an ideal amount of nitrogen and, and oxygen balance and everything and mineral balance in the soil so you can create this concentrated environment in this glass dome to grow crops and get a very good yield 
I think that that's where our agriculture for plants really needs to go, or at least that's one of the methods to, to do. Right. Uh, but that's probably uh, something that I need to learn a little bit or a lot more about before I say any more about it than that. But that's a solid idea. Uh, I was talking with a bodybuilder at my gym. He said it was impossible to maintain the muscle mass and be vegan without some pads. My reply back was, the, the gorilla don't take pads. PEDs, performance enhancement drugs, for those who don't know what pads means. Uh, yeah, you know, interestingly, gorillas are like, very lean they're like nine percent body fat max right and they're jacked they're huge and they're mostly made out of muscle right <laughs> so yeah gorillas and and they will eat up, they will eat up them fruit like nobody business right they got that they got that sugary diet like you wouldn't believe right uh and they're like cousins to us uh so yeah that's a good clap back. But, you know, I mean, look, you got these bodybuilders and they be on all type of gear. They be stuffing their face with all type of meat and eggs trying to get the protein. Struggling to build muscle, right? Because they're lacking the magnesium in their diet. They're lacking vitamin C and all of this, right? Because all they focus on is the macros. Yeah. How to gain weight if someone is suffering from huge underweight issues. With gut health issues, with bloating issues, passing stool just after meal, and every time frequently urinating. You want to have to book a call with me because that's a lot of issues to talk about. And that, that, you'll have me on here at 11 o'clock going through all of this. That requires a lot more detail. Deanna, what's going on? How you doing? If someone is diabetic, could they eat chickpeas? Of course, yes, absolutely. Yeah, Vidya, definitely. Um, yeah, definitely book a call with me, man. We, we got some stuff to talk about. Because when we talk about gut health issues, um, that can get kind of complex. I couldn't tell you, you know, work some sauerkraut in your diet, some miso, some kimchi, uh, some coconut yogurt, have a high raw vegan diet where you're consuming uh, at least... Uh, five to ten servings of fruit a day, things like that. I can provide guidelines like that. But I would need to know a bit more information, right? I would need to know some, some lifestyle information, things like that. So that would, that, that's, that's something that you would book a call for, for sure. I'm enjoying these lives. I haven't, been on, I haven't been on one in a while. Are you still going live on TikTok? Absolutely. I'll be on Tuesday and Thursday, 8 p.m. Eastern on TikTok. So I'm on there. You know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm, I'm on there. I'm putting in the time. You know what I'm saying? We got some issues to talk about. We got some serious stuff to talk about. All right? It's because we, we got to get ready. Okay, the clock is ticking. So having said that, I think I pretty much covered it on my end. You know what I'm saying? If folks got some different, got some questions or whatever, definitely drop them in the comments. For my folks here. Uh, did I explain everything tonight clearly? Was that good? Was that solid? Love your content. Thank you. I appreciate that. I feel like I'm getting a one-on-one -on -one consultation today. <laughs> oh, if you think this is a one-on-one -on -one consultation, let me tell you something. Book a call with me. You're going to see the difference, how much more pointed it is. <laughs> right? Um, oh, yeah, for those of you who want to sign up for coaching or book a call with me uh, or even join my newsletter uh, you'll be able to do that with the links that i've left in the description uh in the in the description box below as they say all right so i'm gonna come to a close you know what i'm saying let y'all go to a, get a get a decent bedtime tonight but I'm going to be doing this stream every Monday. I'm going to be doing this stream every Monday night, 8 p.m. Eastern. So I'm going to be on here. So make sure y'all show up on time. If y'all follow me on TikTok, I'm going to be doing uh, my live stream on TikTok Tuesdays and Thursdays. This Tuesday, I'm going to be doing uh, some meal planning with folks. So you'll be able to get into the comments and drop uh, your height, your weight and age. And we can go over... Um, 
you know, what your calories and macros should be, uh, generally speaking, and do some, you know, do some live meal planning. All right, so definitely tune in on TikTok for that. Uh, let's see. Is intermittent fasting useful for gaining weight? Uh, it can be. Yes, actually, it's it because one big mistake that people make is eating too late. Um, if you have digestive problems, you don't want to eat heavy and then go to bed late. You don't want to do that because you don't want to sleep on a full stomach like that. You want your digestion to be in the earlier portion of the day, and then you want your recovery and digestion and, and whatnot on the end of So you want to load up on your food and your nutrition in the earlier portion of the day, and then recovery and rest and digestion in the later portion of the day. That's really what you want, right? Um, as far as gaining weight, your best bet as far as gaining weight uh, is going to be uh, training, specifically resistance training or hypertrophy training. So you're going to have to get resistance bands or go to a gym and lift some weights and whatnot to actually put on uh, some muscle mass, right? Because just eating more is not necessarily going to lead uh, to weight gain. It's a bit more than that. All right. D, thank you for tuning in. Have a good night. Salute to your valuable suggestions for, uh, for better health issues. For sure. Thank you for tuning in. And uh, I think uh, we can wrap it up from there. I think we got to it. If you, didn't, if you didn't hit the like button, right, like the stream, if you like the stream. Uh, and that does it for this Monday night. So take care, y'all. Talk to you soon.